just make sense for Latin America to be as promiscuous as it can be from Latin American interest perspective themselves and play every single side for whatever it can. At this moment, we are planning to again begin negotiation with China for a trade agreement. I think we're moving into a phase and a period in which uh, there's almost a new order for critical metals. We need to redefine the way cities are planned today, are designed. When you give women the possibility of getting ahead personally, when they start believing in who they are, what they can do, then they make the sky become, become the limit. Hello, I'm Cher Rian. Welcome to this special look back at the Bloomberg New Economy Gateway Latin America. Public and private sector leaders from around the world gathered for two days here in Panama City to delve into key regional issues across trade, finance, health, cities and climate. Their conversations pointed towards solutions to Latin America's most pressing challenges, fusing analysis of important regional milestones with international perspectives from both developed and emerging economies. The program's first day focused on economic trends with an agenda titled Restoring Growth, Jobs and Trust. Where does Latin America belong in a multipolar world? To think that the world is becoming bipolar, that it's bifurcating into two zones, two spheres, China on one, maybe Russia, US on the other. Um, I don't see that happening at all. Ukraine didn't change anything. Ukraine is simply a symptom. It's reinforcing a multipolar distribution of power. And in that world, it just makes sense for Latin America to be as promiscuous as it can be from Latin American interest perspective themselves and play every single side for whatever it can. So I think multipolarity is a great opportunity for Latin America to basically get advantages of playing every single side against each other. What really excites me to Latin, about Latin America is, you know, and, and maybe I shouldn't be excited because, you know, we're huge believers in globalization of the economy, but I think everything that's going on from a geopolitical perspective it is basically forcing a lot of the manufacturers to rethink their, their efficiency, global strategy to manufacture, and start looking at Latin America as a potential great place for manufacturing. One is obviously labor costs have not risen as fast as they have risen in China, but more importantly, we've learned our lessons that once you have a one single supply chain that is based in China, a lot can go wrong. And forget geopolitical, just look at the things that have happened uh, to, to the supply chain through COVID and all that. So I do believe that you're going to have a lot of manufacturing move to Latin American countries, especially Mexico and some Central American countries. And when you do that, then you're basically having capital flowing into the economy that wasn't there before. And I believe Mexicans are as capable as anybody else in terms of manufacturing, you know, all sort of uh, goods that will come into the economy. So I think that's a, a very positive thing that will happen to Latin America. And then secondly, you know, we're in the middle of what I like to call the EV revolution, the electric vehicle revolution, and the U.S. has made some pretty bold commitments. General Motors have made commitments as it relates to most of the cars by 2035 are going to be electric vehicles. Well, today, electric vehicles, one of the main components is the battery. It's anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of the cost of an electric vehicle is in the batteries. And what goes into the batteries to electric vehicles, the most important commodity in this case is lithium. And if you look at, you know, mainly three countries, Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, Bolivia on its own controls 30% of all the lithium reserves in the world. So you're going to see countries that potentially, you know, haven't performed so well economically like Bolivia and Argentina, who just by having the right, you know, commodity, have an incredible potential in the future. And I'm saying Bolivia, just because I'm Bolivian, but Mexico will be a good producer of lithium and, and the rest of the countries have additional copper, they have all the parts are important. So when you look at commodities that are going to be incredibly important, again, the, what, what's happening in Ukraine didn't help, uh, you know, the world, but, you know, price of commodity will be at an all-time high. And this, to me, it's going to last for a while. With the potential of, of uh, uh, manufacturing and supply chain, there's going to be a good inflow of capital to Latin America that we haven't had in the last few years. So this is why I believe that 
this is going to be great. You're making micro loans for women predominantly. They're small loans, but it's not just about the money. You're also providing education and mentorship and guidance. Tell right. me about the activity that, you, that you're doing and how much demand you're seeing. Right, so I think that one of the things that women, especially women at the bottom of the economic ladder are missing is training programs. It's, you know, most of the microcredit loans are given to women and they stay basically flat in the same place where they started because what they think is that they need to just cover the expenses that they have, you know, at hand. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've realized and that I, that I saw years ago was that when you gave women financial literacy, when you give women the possibility of getting ahead personally, when they start believing in who they are, what they can do, then they make the sky become, become the limit. What countries and governments need to know today is that they should wake up, like I do every morning, and saying, who's my competitor and how am I going to compete? And I don't know that that's, the, the, companies, the countries that win are the ones that do that. And Southeast Asia has done a very good job saying, where, where are we competitive, where can we win, and how are we going to grow that, that side of our business? We do the same thing as, com as companies. Latin America needs to do the same thing. Said, where can we win? There is a trade war kind of going on between the United States and China. That, that, those factories are going to move somewhere. They're either going to move to Southeast Asia or they're going to move to Latin America. There's a huge upside in tourism. Tourism is an export. Someone brings foreign currency to your country and they buy something here today. That's a huge opportunity and Latin America has a competitive advantage there. The question is, are they going to take the friction out of it and are we going to look at it as a group and individually to say, how can we win in this area and how can we be competitive? Mexico graduates more engineers than Germany, a fact I learned yes. on a recent trip. Uh, you've got great ex um, engineering expertise in Brazil, in Colombia and elsewhere. So there are, there are pockets of, of expertise which are important today because today the market for that talent is so tight. We're really bullish about the region as far as, as travel goes. And think also the fact that you've got a very young demographic, right? So the one thing that China doesn't have is this, and India has and Latin America has, is this growing young population. That young population, they're tech savvy, they want to grow, they want to move, they're, they're, gonna, they're, they're not happy just to stay in one place. It's going to be a game changer if we're talking about the long run. Is Latin America being seen as a new partner for Europe, for the US, in terms of the supply chain, where to go and have things built, things sourced, things then shipped from? In one word, yes. Absolutely, and there is an opportunity now. It does start with raw materials. It does, and certainly I come from the retail side, so as it relates to CPG goods, and apparel products, footwear products, et cetera, they are, you know, companies need to diversify. We need to have, you know, an easier transition from a language standpoint. There isn't the same language barrier that there is in China as well, so there's an easier transition there. Obviously, we're able to have uh, near shore opportunities which really create being able to have a shorter lead time from a production standpoint. So that's another big opportunity here. The proximity, Mexico has obviously become um, a little bit more important and needs to become even more important to the U.S. In the U.S. alone, while we would love to be able to say that we have domestic opportunity, we don't really. So we do need to continue to look at Latin American countries, Mexico, Peru, and, and every one of them right now uh, has different expertise and different types of materials that they do better than others. But overall, there's an opportunity to do that much more. And Panama has obviously invested a great deal in its ties to China and being a gateway to China. Now that's maybe being called into question. So I, to go back to that, to that phrase, are you, how are you with multiple partners? The US is the main user of the Panama Canal. The second main user of the Panama Canal is China. So we do have a very important relationship with both countries, however. So you're already very promiscuous. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I heard that panel, yes. But, but, our main partner is the USA. Our strategic partner is the USA. You have the important relationship, trading relationship with both the US and China, but when it comes to it, the US is the one. Given how relations have gone in the last few years, does that mean you, are, you would be less focused on a trade agreement with China? How does it change your policy in practice? Our main focus 
during my administration has been facing the pandemic and also economic recovery. At this moment, we are planning to again begin negotiation with China for a trade agreement. Now. Coming up, highlights from day two of the Bloomberg New Economy Gateway Latin America, conversation centering on social and environmental progress. There's not enough financial resources from either side, from the public side or the private side, going into providing those tools. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to our review of the Bloomberg New Economy Gateway Latin America. I'm Sherian. Public health, urban inequality, the global food supply, and environmental sustainability have been critical issues in Latin America for decades. But in the context of an ongoing global pandemic, they've taken on a new complexity and urgency. Day two of the program examined many of these topics with an agenda titled Striving for Social and Environmental Progress. If you tally how this region fared, um, it was terrible. There were, we have 8% of the population Latin American in the Caribbean, we had over 28% death. So as a region, it was the hardest hit in the planet. Um, and one of the key elements, or actually there were two, one is the structural, how you are prepared in terms of the infrastructure, um, healthcare, and the second one, how we were able to acquire the vaccines. Right. Um, Panama um, was able to, before I think uh, most countries were thinking about it, to prepare and, and go out into the market and, and arrange bilaterally right. with, with some of the pharmaceutical companies. But we tried and we tried to get support regionally to, do a, a, to buy them as a block. We didn't do that the first time, and we are actively advocating to prepare and to act as a block. You see the EU is doing that. Right. Um, African nations have already um, aligned themselves, and you have so much more Got power it. to do that. Food insecurity, um, particularly in this hemisphere, uh, has been worsening even before the pandemic. And just the pandemic and, and obviously the, the, the war in Ukraine have only aggravated it. And as, as Ethan said, this is a, a, a triple whammy, right? Food, fuel, funding, three things that are hitting the, the region in full force. Mm -hmm. And I would say climate change, even though it doesn't start with an F, is also something that's affecting uh, you know, the food crisis. At the end of the day, I feel like we are in a situation that we need to collaborate more in order to figure out some alternatives for, for getting out of this situation. And, and maybe that's the time for private and public sectors to be more closer together so that we focus on, on new alternatives and solutions for this. Well, are we seeing collaboration, Arthurin? We're talking about it. We're not seeing enough of it yet. So there's talk about it. There's not enough financial resources from either side from the public side or the private side, going into providing those tools that are necessary to increase the quality and quantity of yields of smallholder farmers. I would say it's, it's, we, we're probably going into a period in which uh, we expect there will be shortage probably of these key metals, considering all that is happening, the restrictions on uh, supply chain, uh, some of the permit extensions which, you know, and, and requirements which, which have been uh, progressing and adding, and we're very committed to responsible and sustaining mining, but it's just taking longer to get, mm. uh, to get copper. So I think we're moving into a phase and a period in which uh, there's almost a new order for critical metals, in which, you know, the, it, it's going to be hard to be able to meet the required uh, demand going forward. There was some discussion at some stage whether with what's happening on the geopolitical side, energy security was going to take predominance over energy uh, transition. But I think it's just accelerating the process. It seems mm. that, on the contrary, this is just creating added demand. So from that point of view, we're very keen on being able to produce to meet that demand. And, uh, and I think uh, 
you know, there's a lot of changes taking place in Chile, in, in Peru, in other, in other jurisdictions. We're very keen that those changes are made with a long-term perspective and that they are, achieve the right balance to be able to continue to promote investment and the development of the industry. Remember just four numbers about cities, 255, 75, and 80. Cities are only 2% of the surface of the planet, but are 55% of the population, 75% of energy consumption, 80% of CO2 emissions. Wow. So as uh, designers, architects, planners, we've got a big, big responsibility in order to make our cities more sustainable, again, from an environmental point of view and also from a social point of view. In terms of urban planning, we need to redefine the way cities are planned today, are designed. And we know that the pandemic has changed the way we're traveling, the way we're working. And then we need to redesign the cities with more walking pedestrian areas, more cycling areas, and, and at the same time to make sure that the cohesion of the communities is there, increasing the resilience to the pandemic. I want us to reflect from the, from the future and say, well, we're gonna answer two things. First, what did we worry about too much? What were we obsessed with about in 2022 that turned out to not be a problem? And the tougher one is, what did we not think about enough? What we're probably not thinking about enough, I, I very much echo the comment on equity. You know, I think today, most of the charging infrastructure that exists, exists in affluent neighborhoods. Um, the prices of the electric vehicles that are in the market today are incredibly expensive. And most people, can, in particular in Latin America, cannot afford them. So we can produce 10 billion of those vehicles. If the price remains where it is, it doesn't matter. We're not going to move the needle on changing the usage of gas-powered vehicles. Um, we, we just have to obsess a lot more about the availability in, in, diff, in all of the neighborhoods, not just, not just for rich people. And so I think that's, that's really what we have to change. And if I were to go ahead 10 years, maybe we aren't thinking enough about. Our policy framework with regard to Venezuela is simple. If there is a negotiated outcome that leads to ambitious, irreversible, and concrete steps toward free and fair elections, the European Union has issued a report. It's very clear what needs to happen. Um, then the United States will, and the international community will alleviate pressure. What I take from what, you're, from what you've just told us is that until you see some sign of a free and fair election in, in Venezuela, regardless of how miserable life may be for ordinary Venezuelans, those sectoral sanctions will remain in place. Is that correct? What I would say is the unilateral lifting of sanctions on Venezuela is not going to improve the lives of Venezuelans. There, there's still a lot of people in Venezuela that are wealthy, uh, that are going to shopping malls, that are doing very well. But for normal Venezuelans, if you get outside of Caracas and even inside Caracas, the lifting of sanctions is only going to line the pockets of the regime. And so we need to, uh, has, has to be accompanied by concrete steps. And I'm not talking about regime change. I'm talking about clear steps that level the electoral playing field, the release of political prisoners, the validation of political parties. If there is uh, wide reporting on steps that are practical, that advance the, uh, the ball uh, in terms of democratic freedoms in Venezuela, and that uh, it is what should be the focus of, of the international uh, community to try to incentivize and to support. Still ahead, more from the Bloomberg New Economy Gateway Latin America, including the potential benefits of blockchain technology and the future of cryptocurrency. In the borders of Jamaica or any other country, we can develop a central bank digital currency that allows persons to send money person to person, person to business easily. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to our review of the Bloomberg New Economy Gateway Latin America. I'm Sherry Ann. A theme that cut across both days of this program was innovation, bringing new ideas and technologies to bear on persistent problems. But leaders have to weigh all possibilities and unintended consequences that can come with innovation, which made for many lively and interesting conversations here in Panama City. For example, sessions dealing with the promise of digital currency and cryptocurrencies. I'm not a big crypto fan, neither personally nor as a central banker. Um, currency for me has to be stable, uh, and cryptos, because they are traded, 
means that they have a lot of volatility in it, so we stay far away from cryptocurrencies. Does it raise the case for an actual central bank digital currency, which is what Jamaica has done? Uh, well, a central bank digital currency, say in Jamaica, serves our domestic market. Uh, it's intended to stay within our borders, not to go beyond that. Once you step outside of the borders of a country, you have to deal with regulations of AML and CFT, and that's a whole different world because everybody wants to know who is sending the money and who is receiving the money internationally, uh, and it's all part of what happened after 9-11, mm. right? So in the borders of Jamaica or any other country, we can develop a central bank digital currency that allows persons to send money person to person, person to business, easily. But once we step outside of the border, we run into all of those regulations. The overall picture from our survey, using data up to the end of 2021, is that 90% of central banks surveyed are engaged in one form or other of uh, CBDCs, right? With respect to crypto, the growing market of crypto in 2021, this was said by 60% of our surveyed central banks to be a motivation to prioritize a CBDC. In Jamaica, we have a national program of trying to digitize the economy. Uh, so whether it has to do with payment services, it has to do with government services, uh, has to do with uh, paying taxes, paying fees, uh, national identification, we want to digitize all of that. And the, the, the intention is to make doing business much easier, more efficient, and more quick. Uh, central bank digital currencies have a lot of, of uh, advantages locally. They're secure, they're very fast, uh, and they tend to in, be more inclusive, bring people into the banking community, people that stay outside of the banking system because of inefficiencies, because of the cost to do with mm. transactions in the banks. Crypto was supposed to break down access barriers to financial services. It was supposed to take out the legacy rent takers, like commercial banks and title insurers. It was supposed to give people control over their own digital identities and so much more. When is crypto going to fulfill that promise? Well, I think that we are seeing uh, these things happening. It just isn't you know, from zero to a uh, hundred, we are absolutely seeing large numbers here in Latin America of people using this technology for things like remittance, and we're, we're seeing it. It is happening. Uh, uh, the fundamentals are there, if you check. In terms of identity, this is an area that I'm very interested in. Uh, I think identity is going to be the big topic of conversation throughout the remainder of this and next year as that sort of next event, we've gone from DeFi to NFTs, I think identity solutions will be uh, uh, a big topic of conversation through the remainder of this and next year. That wraps up our special look back at the Bloomberg New Economy Gateway Latin America. It was an exciting two days for all of us here in Panama City, participating in global conversations with regional impact. Visit BloombergNewEconomy.com for more highlights and for information on future Bloomberg New Economy events. You can also find BNE coverage on Bloomberg TV and radio and on the Bloomberg Terminal. I'm Sherry Ann. This is Bloomberg.